looking forward to tonight's study. We've had uh, quite a bit of time go by since we've done one of the Bible prophecy studies, and uh, um, I'm, I'm glad for, in one sense, because it took a while to compile all this information. See, that's what happens. If you give me two or three months <laughs> to compile, then you're really in for it. <laughs> when we actually get together and say, no, so it's not that bad. Hose, what you're yeah, you're going to be drinking from a fire hose. Yep. Yes. Wow. <clears throat> but um, there's a lot going on in the world, obviously. Uh, we've talked about it quite a bit. <laughs> I don't need to belabor that. Uh, you see the emblems and, and signs and different images that I have up here on the screen. And I, I did that for a, a particular reason, you know. I think that. Um, with all the things that are going on, uh, there are some very ugly images out there uh, that we're dealing with, that we have dealt with in the past. And, uh, you know, some of those things, I think, play directly into Bible prophecy and the things that we're seeing and uh, the possibilities of development of, of certain aspects of Bible prophecy are everywhere we look. And it's hard to pick a subject, it really is. It's hard to say, okay, Here's one subject that we can talk about with Bible prophecy because there's so many out there these days. But um, I've kind of gone back to an older one tonight that we've dealt with um, throughout the church age, really. But I, I do see it coming into play in a, in a big way here in the times that we're living in. And I think in the coming years, we're going to see this. Uh, again, as we talk about Bible prophecy, it's a convergence of a lot of different things at the same time, not one little thing out here, and one little thing over here happening, uh, you know, decades apart from each other, but it's everything coming at one time is when we really start to see Bible prophecy unfold. And, uh, you know, as Jesus talks in, um, we're going to get into uh, chapter 24 again of Matthew, of course, that uh, Olivet Discourse where Jesus just gives us this incredible um, view of the end time scenario from his perspective and the time that he's living in and um, you know as a part of that you know he talks about there's going to be wars and rumors of wars and pestilence and all those kind of things happening and one of the things that he says in that scenario is that we Christians will be hated by all nations <laughs> uh, for his namesake and, uh, you know, we can look at different times in history where that has partially been fulfilled. And, and that's another thing about Bible prophecy is that there are partial fulfillments all along. You know, you could look at Adolf Hitler, and we're going to talk briefly about him tonight, as a partial fulfillment of the Antichrist prophecies. You know, uh, what he does to the Jews and really what he does to the Christian church in Germany to a large degree is a fulfillment of some of the things we see the Antichrist doing in the end. And so I, I think we see these fits and starts uh, as we go through the decades and through the millennia of, of Bible prophecy kind of coming into view and, oh, that could be a sign, and then it kind of goes away for a little while. Uh, but we don't write those things off because they give us indications of how it could happen in the end, I think. Uh, and certainly uh, Hitler gave us some insights into what the Antichrist could possibly do in the end time scenario. And so as we look at it tonight, again, the uh, title Hated by All Nations, this part two of our uh, Biblical Prophecy in 2022 study. And I've got it up here on the, board, on the screen for you. You can just read along with me there. Um, this is just really a starting point that we're going to look at tonight. Obviously, there are many places in the Bible where uh, these things are said. In, in different ways. Uh, most of them, it's Jesus, the one who is speaking about it. Uh, but he says there in Matthew 24, 9 through 10, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. And so, you know, I, I think for the most part, you know, as pre-millennial, uh, pre-trib rapture kind of folks, you know, we view that as what's going to happen in the tribulation. And, and certainly I think the ultimate fulfillment of what Jesus is saying there uh, is, is possibly a tribulation uh, time frame. Certainly within the tribulation, there will be a great persecution of people who call the, on the name of Jesus. Uh, but 
uh, if you believe in a pre-trib rapture, um, Jesus is saying, you will be hated. <laughs> My followers, people who call me their Lord and Savior, are going to be hated and uh, persecuted. Tribulation is going to come upon you. You will, you will be killed. You'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Uh, there's going to be many people that get offended by the things you have to say. And uh, as we look at that idea, I think, you know, certainly the tribulation is one block of, of extreme persecution that will happen against anyone who believes in God at all and doesn't bow their knee to the Antichrist and profess him as God. Uh, obviously, there's going to be a massive persecution and, and really just death for anybody who dares to do that. But leading up to that point, you know, the Bible isn't very clear about the distinctions. How bad will it get before we get raptured? Right? That's a question we want to ask. How bad is it going to get before we actually get raptured? I don't know. But it could get really bad. If you look at what the first century, second century, third century Christians went through, um, you know, tell them it's not going to get bad before the rapture because they'll laugh at you. <laughs> they'll, they'll say, you know, when we get there, you guys think you had it bad in 2022. Well, let me tell you what. <laughs> in 20 or in uh, 122, we had it really bad. <laughs> but... Um, you know, so there are these distinctions that we kind of think about. You know, is that for just the tribulation saints? Is that for pre-trib rapture folks? You know, is it for just those three centuries of persecution after Jesus rose and ascended? You know, I think that um, the key there is all nations. Because in those first 300, uh, 300 years, uh, it was really just the Roman Empire that hated the Christians and were persecuting them and others to other degrees, uh, certainly. But it was Rome that was trying to stamp out the Christian church, obviously fueled by Satan and all those kind of things. But it wasn't all nations. It wasn't the whole world. Uh, and so we can kind of write that off as a fulfillment of this prophecy. Um, certainly in the time that we're living in now, not all nations hate us. Uh, many nations are still very friendly to the Christian faith. But what I want to say tonight is that I think in the time that we are living in right now, the, the seed that will bring upon this type of persecution, that will bring upon the kind of hatred that will turn against the entire Christian faith to the degree that people will say, yeah, we should kill them. Yeah, we should wipe them out. Yeah, we hate them. Get rid of them. Absolutely. Pass whatever law you need to do to do that. You know, that kind of idea. I think we're living in a time right now where those kind of ideologies are being fomented yep. and people are starting to embrace that. And that's what I want to kind of deal with tonight is as far as Bible prophecy goes, is those kind of ideas. They're starting right now and they're gaining strength. They're gaining speed as we go on um, from this point on. And so another verse you can look at there, uh, Luke 21, 16, 17, basically the same thing. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. And so we're looking at a scenario in which all of the nations of the world, the vast majority of the world, has said, we hate Christianity. It's not a good thing. We don't agree with it. We don't see any um, value in it whatsoever. And it needs to be wiped out. It needs to be taken out. It's like the Ku Klux Klan. I mean, you know, everybody would say, yeah, Ku Klux Klan, absolutely, they need to be dismantled and, and destroyed. Christianity will become that kind of a horrible thing where all the people of the world will have an inner hatred for what we have to say, the message that we are preaching, the, uh, the values that we hold. And, uh, and as a result, parents will be saying, my child is a Christian, go get him. And same thing, parents and, and children will be turning in their parents and, and friends and all those kind of things. It's really a horrible scenario, if you think about it. It's a horrible, horrible scenario to even consider but it is 
if we believe that we're living in the last days, it is the future. It is the future for the world that we're living in. Maybe not the immediate future, but certainly, uh, again, I, I believe the, the, um, the pattern is being set forth and laid down. Now, we've talked a lot about uh, persecution against Christians in the sense of radical Islam. And, you know, you remember many years ago, uh, the Christians that were being beheaded by ISIS and, and all that stuff that was happening. And it was in the news a lot. And they were talking about it a lot. And, uh, and certainly there's that level of persecution that's a religious ideology uh, that is sworn to stamp out Christianity. And that is going on, and it has been going on. Uh, it hasn't stopped. The news just doesn't report it anymore. They don't talk about it. It's something that they just, they just don't feel it's important enough to share with the rest of us. And of course, most of the news now is run by very left-wing ideologies who to some degree, probably think it's a good thing that Christianity has been wiped out in a lot of different countries around the world. Uh, Mike Pompeo, former Secretary of State, has said, you know, as a result of Afghanistan falling and us withdrawing from there, uh, the possibility of there being a genocide against Christians in Afghanistan in the wake of this withdrawal is extremely high. Already the Taliban is compiling lists of known Christians and their communities, they're going door to door searching Afghan homes for Bibles, mm. even searching smartphones for Bible apps. And so, um, you know, we kind of have come to expect that from places like Afghanistan and uh, Saudi Arabia and those kind of places who uh, have a large population of Muslims who just are sworn against Christianity. And uh, we, we come to expect that, certainly. Um, but, you know, there's a, an extreme possibility that uh, it could get very, very bad for those Christians living around the world. It, it is very, very bad, but it could get even worse as uh, the press turns its eye or turns its focus away from those things and uh, those things are allowed to continue. And so, again, we think about what has happened in the past, the first 300 years of Christianity, uh, the, the Christians being fed to the lions, being burned at the stake, uh, being uh, dipped in wax and, and set afire to light up the gardens of the Roman emperors, you know, those kind of things. I mean, just awful, awful, terrible uh, things that happened to Christians in the past. Um, we want to uh, understand that, you know, it, it really is worse than it was back in those 300 years. There are ideas that there are more Christians being persecuted now than there were in the time of the Romans when they were doing those things in the Colosseum. And uh, somebody has said Christian persecution is the world's ignored pandemic. The persecution of Christians is cons uh, consistently on the rise, increasing by nearly 70% over the last five years. Breitbart News recently reported that more than 360 million Christians are facing high levels of persecution. Mainstream media covers spectacular incidents, but rarely mention the slow motion bleeding type of persecution ongoing daily. The burning and banning of churches by governments, brutal attacks on blasphemers and apostates, that's what they call us, and the systematic desecration of entire Christian communities. And there are statistics, I'm gonna show a few tonight, overseas, you know, where there, there used to be, you know, 20% of the population was Christian and 80% was Muslim. Now it's, you know, completely flipped and, uh, or not flipped, but, um, you know, maybe 95% Muslim and, you know, just 5% Christian along those lines. And um, it doesn't come out in the news, but it's because there was a systematic desecration of those Christian communities. They were either killed or they were forced to, uh, convert to Islam or be killed. And, and many of them just gave into that, that pressure. And so uh, it's still going on. Don't let anybody tell you it's not. Extreme left, leftist secularization empowers this Islamic and ideological hostility abroad while proliferating anti-Christian animosity here at home. And you know, they do it through their academia, 
the media, governments, uh, the, our government really has now uh, taken on that mantle of, of turning against Christianity to a large degree. And as, as we think about, uh, you know, where our government is now, uh, all three branches being run by one, uh, deno or one um, uh, political party and how it came to be that, you know, those things are very troubling as we understand that, you know, many in the Democrat Party are, uh, you know, socialists, if not Marxists, they're communists. And that's the direction they want to take our country. And they see Christianity as standing in the way of that. And, and so they're very much opposed to um, allowing Christianity to have a voice at all in that sense. And so uh, these are the times we're living in. Uh, here's a graphic for you. Each month in the world, across the world, 322 Christians are killed for their faith. 214 churches and Christian properties are destroyed. And when it says properties, you know, it could be just somebody who is a Christian who is running some kind of shop. And because they're a Christian, their neighbors burn their shop down, those kind of things. But a lot of churches also are being destroyed. Schools uh, where kids are being taught Christian principles. Uh, those kind of things are being destroyed, uh, 214 properties every month, which is a staggering amount of buildings. I mean, one way or the other. Of course, 322 Christians being killed is even more staggering. Uh, 772 forms of violence are committed against Christians. Uh, I don't know if you read that last part there. Uh, beatings, abductions, rapes, arrests, and forced marriages. Um, these are some of the things that, that folks deal with over in the Muslim countries um, where somebody might have converted to Christianity and uh, are forced to marry a Muslim uh, against their will and against their, their beliefs. So those are the kind of things that are happening around the world. And again, and that's a, bit, a big picture of what's happening in the world. Don't have time to get into any details on that, but... Uh, I wanted to think about what's happening in our country because you say, well, that's always been going on overseas. That's always happening. You know, for the last 1,400 years, Muslims have been, you know, trying to wipe out the Christians everywhere they go. And all those kind of things are, are very true, really. For 1,400 years, this has been an ongoing thing where uh, Muslims will, you know, encroach upon their neighboring Christian country and uh, cause conflict and, and draw them into fights and, and then you know, uh, as a retaliation, go and wipe them out. But it's a deliberate thing, right? I mean, they, they bring on the conflict. Oh, they retaliated against us. So now we have the right to go in and wipe them out completely. And that's kind of what they've been doing really for 1,400 years. Taking over churches, burning churches, killing Christians. I mean, it's the ongoing thing. But here in America, obviously, we were uh, brought into being by the hand of God. We believe, you know, the providence of God is established here us here as a, a godly Christian nation built on those Judeo-Christian principles. And, uh, you know, we've had uh, a pretty good run for the last 240 some odd years. How, however long is it? What are we at now? 240, whatever it is. I, I didn't think about that before. Mm -hmm. but <laughs> Come on, somebody, 46. historians out there. 46. 46, 46. right. So um, it's been quite a run, uh, but here we are at the beginning of the, the third millennia, and uh, there is certainly uh, a lot of evidence to say that we are now a post-Christian nation, is what they call us. We're no longer a nation that is ruled by those uh, Judeo-Christian values, and uh, whether that's completely true or not, I don't know, but uh, certainly we can see signs that we're going in a very different direction than that. And the powers that be, uh, the media, the, the academia, certainly. Am I going dead here? Yeah. Yeah, that muted something that it wasn't supposed to break. Okay. You're ready. Am I good now? <laughs> okay. So um, anyway, uh, Time Magazine is not exactly a, a conservative bastion of, uh, <laughs> of any sort of journalism. But uh, they wrote an article back in 2016 called Regular Christians Are No Longer Welcome in American Culture. 
and they talked about some of these ideas. Of course, uh, we're four or five years after that now, and as a result of Trump and, you know, like him or love him, hate him, you know, uh, what he was re uh, presenting as uh, a vision of American future and, and how that all ended um, and, you know, where we are now, uh, certainly it has gotten worse, I, I believe, for uh, Christian society. And uh, what they said in this article is interesting, I thought. Uh, he starts out by, I actually think it's a, a woman who wrote, uh, first we must understand that red-hot rhetoric about a war on Christianity is misbegotten. There is zero equivalence between the horrors of ISIS-led genocide against Christians in the Middle East and what, the, and what Pope Francis calls the polite persecution of believers in the West. And I, I think there is some truth to that. Certainly, you know, when we get too overblown about, oh, the persecution that's happening to us here in America, you know, it's not anything like what's happening overseas in Afghanistan or, you know, where, what ISIS did back in the, in the Obama years and those kind of things. Um, but um, to say that it's just a polite persecution, I think, belies the fact that there are these seeds of animosity that are growing. And, uh, and certainly, uh, once you have uh, an ideological shift on the level of what we're going to talk about here tonight, there is, there, there is cause for great concern, I believe. And, and I do believe that it's uh, a part of this end time scenario that will ultimately end in the tribulation period in which, uh, you know, people that uh, believe in God will be killed for their faith. Now, <clears throat> She goes on there, she says, Yet, we must also acknowledge that when some American citizens are fearful of expressing their religious views, something new, whoops, can't lean on that so, so much, something new has snaked its way into the village square, an insidious intolerance for religion that has no place in a country founded on religious freedom. And uh, that's also true, I, I believe, you know, that there has been this shift that has taken place, and I think it's good for us to acknowledge it. Uh, we can bemoan it, we can woe is me about it, but, um, and, you know, I'm not here to say we need to get out there and protest against it or any of those kind of things. I believe my, my job is to prepare believers to deal with it and to not be blindsided by it, not to be shocked by it. Are you really shocked that Satan's out there trying to undermine us and make us look bad and, and make people hate us? Should that shock us? No, it shouldn't. And so the fact that it's happening now, um, obviously, you know, we'd rather live in the 1950s America where Christianity is very popular and everybody goes to church on Sunday morning and in their nice dresses and suits and ties and, and all that stuff. But that's not the world we live in now. And so there's no sense in going back to Mayberry and, and uh, complaining about it. We've got to be prepared, first of all, to endure it, but also to triumph over it. And, uh, you know, win as many souls to Christ as possible in the midst of it. And so that's my call, is just to uh, shore you up with some encouragement in these times that we're going through, not to candy coat it or... Uh, you know, give it some kind of Pollyannish view, uh, we are up against it. I would say that. We are up against some tribulation in the coming years. And uh, I think it's best if we just acknowledge it and, and get ready for it. And so um, that's what I want to do tonight is just to prepare you for that. Uh, again, we see in the book of Revelation this same call for uh, an understanding about the persecution that is headed our way. Revelation 6, 9, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar of uh, the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. And so this call, all these uh, martyred Christians under the throne of God, and they're crying out, Lord, how long until you finally set things right? 
until you finally restore justice on the earth, until you finally take vengeance for the, uh, all of these Christians who have paid this very, very dear price for the last 2,000 plus years. And, um, and so we see it in Scripture. There is, there has been, and there will be persecution against Christians, and not just people making fun of you because you've got a, a fish on the back of your bumper. You know, it it's, can be much worse than that, and we should expect it to be much worse than that. But we also have to acknowledge that we have the Spirit of the living God dwelling in us. And there is no situation that he cannot get us through. There is no bit of persecution and tribulation that he can't walk us through. And so I'm kind of straddling the midterm, <laughs> pre-trib, whatever. You know, I'm not talking about that stuff tonight. I, I am a firm mid, I'm just kidding, pre-trib <laughs> rapture Christian. And um, I do believe that we're going to be raptured before the tribulation. But I also believe that, uh, as I said in the beginning, there's no guarantee that we won't go through a, a, a tremendous amount of persecution before that happens. And so um, when I talk about this tonight, I'm just saying it in a very general view. I'm not trying to establish a timeline here. I'm saying the Bible says we're going to be persecuted. We're going to be killed. We're going to be martyred. Not all of us, obviously. There, there are obviously times, hundreds and hundreds of years, where Christians didn't have to deal with that kind of stuff at all. But I believe we're living in a time where it's coming. Uh, maybe just for our kids. Maybe not for us, but maybe for our kids. I don't know. But uh, we see it throughout Scripture, and uh, I, I think it's good for us to arm ourselves with it. So why do they hate us so much? Why do they hate us so much? Well, we oppose everything they're about. <laughs> you know? They have this, hey, we want unrestrained sexual immorality. Don't tell us what we can do, who we can love. And we stand there with that Bible in our hand and say, you know what? Every sexual encounter outside of the bonds of marriage is a sin, <laughs> you know. And they don't like that. We're going against their sexual mores. And we're not only going against it, we're telling them they're sinners. And they're going to go to hell unless they repent. And they don't like it. And, uh, and, and so, you know, in the past, it's been this thing where we've had that message on our lips. And because so much of the population was Christian, or at least had a Christian understanding, they received that, or at least understood it enough to say, okay, that's what the Bible says. I believe it, but I'm just not willing to repent right now. I'll repent later, kind of a thing, you know, maybe. Uh, but of course, you know, for the last... 50 years or so, uh, our society has been getting further and further away from that biblical foundation. Fewer and fewer kids are going and, and being raised in a Christian home and given that biblical understanding. And as a result, when people hear that now, they think we're crazy. You know, they think we're the ones that are on the outside of normality, right? They think we're the repressed um, psychopaths that the, the movies have portrayed us to be. And, uh, you know, it's just where we are now. They hate us for standing against that. They hate us for standing against abortion, which allows them to have the unrestrained sexual immorality that they crave. And uh, so everything that they are about, we seem to be against. And uh, that doesn't make for good uh, friendships <laughs> along the way. <laughs> And when people are not controlled by the Holy Spirit and when they're controlled by their flesh, they tend to get very angry at those kind of things and they want to strike out against you. Maybe not physically, but they certainly want to do things like um, get on the Board of Education in the local town and make sure that Christians don't have any kind of say-so whatsoever about what their kids are hearing in school. Maybe that, you know. Uh, maybe become a senator, maybe a president, all those kind of things, they act with their activism. And they go out and they, they try to silence the Christian voice as much as possible. They suppress the truth of God, uh, something for which the Bible tells us that 
God's wrath will be revealed against those who suppress the truth of God in Romans chapter 1. And so um, we're against that, and they don't like it. They are worshiping the creature more than the creator. And, uh, and we speak out against that, obviously. Uh, more and more, uh, this green, um, save the planet, global warming, global uh, climate change, nonsense has woven itself into the fabric of every child's mind. And as a result of us saying it's all going to burn and, <laughs> you know, it's more important to worship God than it is to worship Mother Gaia and Mother Earth and all those kind of things, um, that makes them angry as well. We are standing against them saving Mother Gaia. Uh, and and make no doubt about it. I mean, some of these folks are uh, squarely in the camp of really, truly worshiping the creature. If not the earth itself, then themselves and humanity itself. Uh, humanism has become more important than uh, what God's word has to say. Worshiping the creature is is a part of what humanism is about. It's more important to take care of the needs of people and take care of, of man and make sure he is exalted to that high place than it is to exalt the creator to that high place. And so that is something that we, um, as Christians, we stand in the way of that as well. We oppose all kinds of measures to, um, you know, do the... Uh, you know, I, I don't want to come across as I don't care about the trees and the whales and all that kind of stuff. Obviously, uh, we need to be responsible. God tells us in his word to, uh, you know, take dominion of the earth and care for the earth and take care of the earth. But there's a, a very great distinction between that and worshiping the earth uh, that we see a lot. Um, we stand against this revisionist view of America. You know, as we come out and say, you know, by the providence of God, we are here. <laughs> you know, we have our liberty and we have our freedom because the creator uh, made this place uh, to be a, a safe haven for those who wanted to worship him according to his word. And, you know, we talk about the providence of God. We talk about God's guiding hand and all those kind of things. And, and they come out and they revise history to say, we're all just a bunch of bigots and we're, you know, we stole this land and, and we're terrible and this never was a good nation and all those kind of things. And uh, we as Christians, conservative Christians especially, you know, we're, we're standing in the way of this revisionist history that's being taught to all of our kids. And uh, we speak out against it and, and they hate us for that reason as well. Obviously, evolution and Big Bang cosmology, you know, we say in the beginning God created it all, including us, and they say there is no God. What are you talking about? It all created itself because it exploded one day. You know, we've gone over that quite a bit here on Wednesday night, so I'll belabor that. Uh, we say there's a creator God, and uh, salvation, because we're lost, because man has fallen, away from God, that creator God that uh, made a standard of righteous, righteousness for us to uphold. Um, you know, because of that fall of man, we need to be saved. And Jesus is the only way that can happen. And of course, that is anathema to the, the leftist agenda. Uh, first of all, they believe we evolved and there was no fall. There was no fall, so there's no reason for a savior. There's no reason for us to accept Jesus as our Savior because we never fell in the first place. And we're just getting better and better and better. And as soon as we learn, everyone learns all these humanistic principles and we save the planet, everything's going to be great. We don't need a creator God. We don't need Jesus to save us. Those kind of ideas. And, of course, this goes into the secular humanist ideology um, that we see everywhere we go. So we, as Christians, as Bible-believing conservative Christians, and I'm not saying conservative in the sense of political conservatism. Conservative. Conservatism. There you go. Conservatism. Mm -hmm. it's, it's conservatism as far as 
we believe the Bible is true. We believe it's authoritative in our lives. We believe it's inerrant and those kind of things. We follow the Bible. We live by the Bible and, uh, and believe that it's um, true in every sense. Amen. Um, amen. So uh, secular humanism, of course, believes, no, that's all hogwash, um, that there is no absolute truth. All truth is relative and, and all those kind of ideas. And so we are a major, major, I mean, I think we underestimate how much of a major uh, stumbling stone we are to that leftist ideology. And we wonder why they get so upset. And we wonder why they do the things they do, why they burn buildings down and, and rig elections. And oh, did I say that out loud? We wonder why they do those things. Well, they do those things because they absolutely hate the message that we're preaching. They hate the book that we read from, and they want to do away with it completely so that they can advance these ideologies, progress them, as far as they can possibly take them. And we are the ones standing in the way of, of that being accomplished. Which is why, you know, when the Bible says that the man of sin, the Antichrist, cannot be revealed until that which restrains is taken out of the way. We are the ones that the Holy Spirit is working through. We are the ones that are restraining the evil that Satan wants to bring upon the earth. And once we are taken out, once we are raptured out, then the restraints are off. And now the Antichrist is able to come in and do whatever he wants to do. And so that whole ideology and all that theology that goes into that is really at the crux of what we're talking about here. It's why they hate us so much. And, and of course, it's fueled by Satan. It's fueled by uh, Satan wanting to overthrow the uh, the faith of many upon the earth and drag as many to hell as he can. Obviously, there are rabbit trails and things you could go down that uh, go into more detail about those kind of things and the the humanist ideologies that are involved in all that kind of stuff. Uh, we're kind of on the tail end, maybe, of this global pandemic and. Uh, you know, who knows where all that, that's going to end. It's interesting, though, we talk about the academia and how much they hate our message. And we, we just recently had a, a middle school teacher recently caught on camera complaining about people who oppose vaccinations and said she wishes conservative Christians would get COVID and die. She was caught on camera saying that. And uh, it's quite shocking, you know. This is a person who is teaching our little ones, and we send them off to, to get educated. This is an example, and I'm not saying all teachers are like that, obviously. This is an example of, of some of the leftist ideologies that go into public schools nowadays that really just absolutely hate the, the Christian faith and would like to see it die. So uh, it's quite ugly, and um, you see it there. It can become very, very ugly indeed. Um, someone has said Christians are commanded to abstain from sexual immorality, which includes the whole LGBTQR42, whatever. Uh, so it follows that they are seen as bigots or homophobes or intolerant. Since students are taught to oppose homophobia and anything remotely anti-LGBTQ, they are beginning to perceive Christians as their number one enemy. And I think that's a pretty good way of thinking about this germ of hatred towards Christianity. It's being taught to our kids at the lowest levels. They are learning save the planet, global warming, LGBTQ, they are being brainwashed into accepting these ideologies. And then when they see Christians opposing what they have been brainwashed to believe, they see us as their enemy from the time they're in the kindergarten. And that is what we're up against. That is what we're up against. The whole generation is being raised to view our, our, our view of things as, uh, as a bad way of living life 
a bad way of taking care of the earth and a, a hateful way of interacting with each other. And so uh, we're homophobes, we're intolerant, we're bigots. That is what they're being taught. And so you can see very easily by that quote right there how successive generations of those kind of things being taught in the schools could raise up a generation that just says, you know what, we're sick and tired of these Christians and, and their way of, of talking and living and what they're saying and speaking out against us, and we're going to do something about it. That's what happened in Germany. At some point, they just said, you know, we're sick and tired of these Jews having all the money and, and telling us what to do and running our country for us, and, and we're going to do something about it. And they did. And that's how ideologies work. You get enough people who hate a certain group enough because of their ideology, at some point, people want to take action and they want to do something about it. And so um, it's, a, it's a frightening thought, certainly. Look at what Amos 5.10 says. I don't know if you can read that or not, but it says, They hate him who reproves in the gate, and they abhor him who speaks with integrity. And so you see that idea of just the, the flipping over. Everything that's good is bad. It's evil. Everything that's evil is really good. You know, the person sitting at the gate saying, here's what God's word says. This is right. This is wrong. Oh, we hate those people. Those people are awful. We abhor those who speak with integrity. And uh, we're seeing that in our society right now. That the things that the Bible says are good, the community, the society, the, the media, the academia says, that's evil, that's terrible. We, we abhor that. And so that's kind of where we are now. That's where we are now. And uh, I, I do believe it's part of the end time scenario. Uh, but hold on, I think, is a, a good encouragement for us here. Also, because in Revelation 3.8, we find Jesus uh, speaking to the churches of uh, the Revelation there. And he says, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For if you have a little strength, for you have a little strength, have kept my word and have not denied my name. And so... The, regardless of how bad it may get, and certainly it can get very bad, uh, we have to hang on. We have to hang on. We have to keep his word, regardless of what the society tells us. Regardless of how much they tell us, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. We don't want to hear it. We still have to be those people in the gate saying this is what God's word says. And if you don't repent, you will perish. It's not a popular message. It's a very unpopular message. But we have to keep it because that's what God's word says. And we cannot deny his name. When we deny his word, we deny him. And so it's uh, an encouragement for us. A couple of things here, and then we'll close. Anti-Christian bigotry is the only form of acceptable Intolerance remaining in this country. You probably heard uh, that said to a, to a degree. To be encouraged and incited by our tolerant liberal friends in academia, the media, and entertainment. Christian principles are foundational to the American Republic, yet what matters to the left is silencing the Christian influence of this nation. The battle to destroy Christianity is really the battle to destroy America. And I would say that needs to be flipped. Really, the battle to destroy America is really about the battle to destroy Christianity, I think is, is more accurate. I mean, they're both accurate, but the, the latter, I think, is more accurate. The battle to destroy America is really about destroying the Christian principles that established America, right? And so they see when we hear them and we see them revising history uh, we have to understand what they're really attacking is the Christian faith what they're really attacking is Jesus himself God himself because they hate him now 
I don't know if you guys watch the show or not, uh, but it, it's a good example of, you know, how Christians are portrayed within, uh, this is the show The Office, by the way, but um, this woman is portrayed at, she's a Christian, she's supposedly a Christian, but she's just over the top, um, you know, divisive, mean, mean-spirited, um, very sheltered, very narrow-minded. I mean, every negative thing you could say about a person, uh, she represents it, really, and is trying to be this image of what a Christian is, is like. And uh, she's the most hateful person on the whole show. And that's a show that ran for 10 years, and it was a very, very popular show. I mean, it's still in reruns now, and uh, and full disclosure, we watch it. <laughs> we watch the uh, the cleaned up version of it, but um, you know it's it's a funny show. It's a it's a hilarious show, and uh, but that's how Christians are being portrayed, uh, and really for for many decades now, Christians have been portrayed in the media like that as just being very narrow minded and hateful and and mean-spirited and those kind of things. But that's uh, kind of how the media has portrayed it, and it, it just makes people think, oh, Christians? Oh, I know what Christians are like. I don't like those people. You know, and, and it just puts us in that very negative light. The intolerant left is replacing the structure of an orderly and benevolent norm with falsehoods, distortions, intimidation, and violence. Unfortunately, traditional American Christians have been on the losing end of the culture war for a long time. You know, it's true that we, we kind of win some lawsuits here and there, but on, on the, you know, average, I, I think we're losing this culture war. There's no doubt about it in my mind that we've lost the culture war. Um, and, uh, and badly, if you look at what our society embraces now as opposed to Christianity, I think we've lost it badly. A vigorous new secularism in recent years, however, has propelled ridicule of Christianity into the mainstream of acceptable behavior. It has become part of the larger pop culture. Today, Bible bashing and Christian mocking are a favorite pastime on television, in movies, and on social media, complete with ugly insults and death wishes. And... Um, you know, it's just kind of what we see every time we watch TV. If they talk about Christians, it's in a negative light. Um, this uh, quote here, and these are just several different articles that I found in, in different magazines, different uh, blogs, and, and so um, some negative or some positive towards Christianity, some negative. But uh, Christian beliefs in the sanctity of life, free will, and the flawed nature of humanity are the principal bulwarks against a decent uh, descent into barbarian, barbarism, sorry, that progressivism promises. To the degree that Christians speak up for biblical virtue and sexual purity, and to the degree that they preach the gospel as the one true way of, to God, they are scorned and ridiculed. And again, the reason I'm bringing these to your attention is, you know, this is what we're preaching, but this is how it's viewed by the world. And this is how they reinterpret it and uh, put it across, is how Christians are. But it's beyond ridicule when their observ uh, observance of biblical sexuality or the opposition to the reclassification of marriage gets them labeled as contemptible extremists and bigots who are not worth the air they breathe. Much of their rhetoric on the left is hateful and over the top and should be condemned. And so I, I think this person kind of writing the feds, but they see the degree to which Christians are being ridiculed and, uh, and the extreme comments that are being made against Christianity. Um, here's a chart here. I didn't want to go too much into statistics because there's a lot of them out there and I don't want to bore you with it. But I, I think this is a telling one here. As you see, the weekly attendance of Christians uh, going to church on a weekly basis 
and uh, and then the rise of people who have never attend church, never go to church, never have any kind of affiliation with a church or religious view at all. Uh, it's really going in the opposite directions in a in a pretty dramatic way, and I think that's through uh, 2016 where you see over 25% now of people who just have never gone to church and don't have any kind of uh, religious experience at all in their lives. Um, and, and then again, probably a 10% decline in uh, churchgoers. This is kind of similar, uh, just the rise of people who don't have any kind of affiliation. You could say it's agnostics and atheists, but it's not necessarily how the survey was done, but it really works out to be people who don't care about religion enough to make any kind of effort whatsoever. And that, again, is on the rise. Uh, I was looking for some really good stats on atheism itself, and there are some out there, um, but certainly atheism, there's a, a new form of atheism that's out there now. In the past, atheism has really been... Um, you know, you just kind of kept your mouth shut about it. If you didn't believe in God, you just didn't go to church and didn't talk about God. Now, atheism has become this uh, Christianity bashing, um, very vocal, very activist kind of uh, fervor of an evangelist going out and preaching the fact that there is no God, <laughs> you know, and, and you Christians are idiots if you believe it. You know, that kind of thing. And so it's really taken on a very uh, activist quality. And, uh, and so you see that happening in our nation as well. Um, Revelation 2.13, again, in the uh, letters to the churches area of the book of Revelation, Jesus says, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name. And did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. And so this is really that picture of, you know, people living in the midst of very, very difficult times. And even in the midst of, you know, it looks like Satan is like right there inflicting the terrorism upon you. And, and still you don't deny the faith. Still you hold to his, um, hold to the name of Jesus even to death and become a faithful martyr. And so uh, I, I draw that to your attention because I think, you know, in light of what Hitler did, um, you know, I really see a lot of parallels between what could happen in an antichrist ruled world in the tribulation period and what Hitler did. And what Hitler was trying to do was, you know, the final solution, he said, right? These Jews have been a problem for us for, you know, hundreds of years, and we're done with it. Here's the final solution. We're going to kill them all. You know, it's kind of the idea that he had. And uh, they had fomented enough hatred towards the Jews that the German people turned their back and said, okay, do it. Yeah, absolutely. Some of them didn't know, uh, but a lot of them did know and they allowed it to happen. They didn't stop it. They weren't courageous enough to stand up and say, this is wrong. And here we find, you know, in this time of the Antichrist and before the time of the Antichrist, there has to be this buildup of hatred towards Christianity for some of, this, some of the, the prophecies to come to pass that we see. And um, so I just wanted to look briefly here at... Uh, the Nazi concentration camps and, and the correlation that I, I think that we should be aware of. And um, it's interesting here, uh, the goal of Nazi propaganda was to demonize Jews and create a climate of hostility and indifference toward their plight. On the night of broken glass, which is when all the troops came in and took their property, uh, Jewish businesses and synagogues were destroyed in the first act of state-sponsored violence against the Jewish community. Many Jews who had the means to uh, try to leave Germany, but encountered countries, I'm sorry, encountered countless bureau bureaucratic hurdles and were eventually swept up into the concentration camps. 
And so, um, you know, it goes into detail here about all the laws that they passed. And it was a gradual thing. It was a step-by-step -step process of alienating this group and demonizing them in the eyes of the society to the point where they could finally do what they wanted to do in the end. And I think we could probably look at what's happened already, you know, since the 1960s, all these laws that are gradually getting passed. Oh, you know, you can't really pray in school anymore. Oh, you can't preach the Bible in school. You can't preach, teach creation in school anymore. You can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this. You know, there have been, this has been happening to Christianity in, here in this country for the last 50 years. And it will continue to go on, I believe, and probably to a greater degree. You see here the first six years of Adolf Hitler's dictatorship. Jews felt the effects of more than 400 decrees and regulations on all aspects of their lives. The regulations gradually but systematically took away their rights and property, transforming them from citizens into outcasts. Many of the laws were national ones issued by the German administration, affecting all Jews. State and regional and municipal uh, officials also issued many decrees in their own communities. As Nazi leaders prepared for war in Europe, anti-Semitic legislation in Germany and Austria paved the way for more radical persecution of the Jews. And, you know, we think about what happened here last year and the last two years, you know, the government coming down without a law being passed from Congress or anything else. You can't go to church anymore. <laughs> you know, those kind of things. I mean, that really freaked out a lot of us, you know, and rightfully so. Do they have the right to tell us that we can't open our church doors? Do they have the right to tell us we can't go to church? You know, and, and we really struggle with that. Here, the leadership, you know, what are we doing? What are we going to do? Are we going to go? We're going to stand? Are we going to die on this hill? You know, and, um, you know, praise the Lord, it worked out the way it did. And I think four weeks staggered over two years is the most that we took off and closed the doors, mainly because we were all sick as dogs and we couldn't come <laughs> down here. But, you know, um, you wonder about some of this stuff. You know, are they really doing this for the safety and the welfare of people or is this a false flag to try to see how much they can get away with you know and those are the kind of things that we wonder about and think about in light of what happened in germany in light of what happened in in other places and in light of what biblical scriptures we see uh in the end times and so um a couple things here the first wave of Nazi anti-Semitic legislation from 1933-1934 focused on limiting the participation of Jews in German public life. In September 1935, the Nazi leaders announced the Nuremberg Laws, which institutionalized many of the radical theories prevalent in Nazi ideology. And so that's where we are right now, I think in one sense, is that there are a lot of ideologies that are dictating how we're going to live our lives in the next coming decades. You know, the, the left-wing ideologies are coming in. They're being accepted by a larger swath of the population, and uh, they're, they're getting enough people into Congress and into the Senate to pass laws to put that stuff into law that we have to abide by it. And, um, you know, I don't have any examples right off the top of my head, but I'm sure you can think of some, if you thought about it long enough, some of the laws that have been passed in the last couple of years. Um, you know, it doesn't matter if you own your shop, if, uh, if a homosexual couple comes in and they want you to bake them a cake, you have to, you know, by law. You know, you can't keep your kids from going to school, you know, all those kind of things. You know, those, to a large degree, are based on ideology and based on who's running the country at the time, who's in power, and who's willing to enforce the laws that are on the books, and who's not willing to enforce the laws that are on the books. And those kind of things are happening. But again, you know, what happened in Germany, make no mistake about it, it was because radical theories prevalent in the Nazi ideology were at work. They believed that they were the superior Aryan race that was destined to have a Third Reich. 
and that these Jews are standing in the way of that. And as a result, we need to kill them. That comes from ideology. And uh, we're seeing ideology at work in the times that we live against the Christian way of life. It's a frightening thing. Nazi legislation in 1937 and 38 increased the segregation of Jews from their fellow Germans, ultimately requiring Jews to identify themselves in ways that would permanently separate them from the rest of society. And, and then, of course, they were just, they had all their possessions taken away and they were put on trains and taken to the concentration camps and many of them killed. And so, um, another verse that we look at here, uh, and I swear I only, I only have one more slide after this one, I think. <laughs> Mark 13, uh, again, Jesus, verse 11. But when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak. But whatever is given you in that hour, speak that. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit now, brother will betray brother to death, and a father, his child, and children will rise up against their parents, or rise up against parents, and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated for all, for my name's sake, by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end, he shall, uh, he endures to the end, shall be saved. And so you see there, uh, kind of a, a bringing together of all the elements that we've talked about here tonight. Um, but don't worry about it. Don't premeditate. Just speak what the Holy Spirit gives you at the time, at the moment. Uh, live the life that God has called you to live now. Be aware of the things that are going on. Be ready to uh, act in that time, if it should come in the time that we live. And um, speak the name of the Lord. Don't worry about it. Um, that's it. Any questions before we close? Let me pray real quick, and then we'll, yeah. we'll ask questions. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word here tonight. We thank you, Lord, even though these things are very dark and, and uh, a bit dreary for us to hear, Lord, we know that you have prepared the way. You have foreseen these things, and you have sought to inform us so that we may be ready and we may be able to, in the midst of horrible, horrible situations, stand firm upon your word, stand firm upon your truth, and not be afraid, because we know that you are standing there next to us, the one who has died for these things. And Lord, we know that your spirit will lead and guide us in the time when it comes, if we need to speak out. And we praise you for these things, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.